Could medical nationalism kill? Hello, everyone. I'm Francois Picard. Welcome to the France 24 debate. As the UN in Geneva hosts the 73rd annual World Health Assembly, never have the stakes been higher. And yet, superpower rivalries, nationalism, and financial interests have already triggered a blame game over who's at fault for the coronavirus, the hoarding of face masks, and the discarding of WHO-approved test kits, and now a frenetic battle over who gets first dibs on an eventual vaccine. A battle so fierce it's been likened to a Cold War-style space race. In a globalized world, diseases don't stop at national borders. So are the high and mighty of this small blue marble we live on ready to take up the call of South Africa's president for a people's vaccine available to all fast? It brings us back to that lack of global leadership we're currently experiencing. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the sometimes toxic response to COVID-19. Joining us, uh, Dr. Jean-Jacques Zambrowski, Professor of Public Health Management at the University of Paris Descartes. Welcome back to the show. Good afternoon. We want to welcome as well uh, Stuart Bluma, Professor Emeritus of Science at the University of Amsterdam and the author of Immunization, How Vaccines Became Controversial. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yanis Natsis is a policy manager for Universal Access and Affordable Medicines at the U European Public Health Alliance and Advocacy Group in Brussels. How are you, sir? All good. Pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag is F24Debate. Uh, yeah, that uh, WHO meeting taking place in Geneva, uh, coming uh, amid a lot of finger pointing. And it's exactly what we don't need at the current moment. And Nagunke has more. It's undoubtedly among the WHO's most important assemblies in its more than seven decades of existence. But political bickering risks jeopardizing international coordination, particularly between the United States and China. Last month, Washington even suspended funding to the WHO, accusing the organization of kowtowing to Beijing. Had the WHO done its job to get medical experts into China to objectively assess the situation on the ground and to call out China's lack of transparency, the outbreak could have been contained at its source with very little death. China has rejected the accusation. In response, making unproven claims the U.S. military may have brought the coronavirus to Wuhan. The World Health Organization, which depends on U.S. funding, has taken a more diplomatic approach, simply insisting it reacted in a timely manner. The most important thing in which is expected as a declaration from WHO is the global emergency declaration on January 30. I think we declared the emergency at the right time. Despite the simmering tensions, the 194 member states hope to agree on a joint response to the crisis, especially as it relates to a potential vaccination, largely seen as the key to returning to normal life. Ahead of the meeting, some 50 current or former world leaders signed a letter encouraging countries to work together on quickly producing a vaccine and ensuring universal access to it. But not all countries are on the same page. Just last week, the United States launched Operation Warp Speed with the goal of developing a coronavirus vaccine specifically for the American people. Jean-Jacques Zambrowski, Operation Warp Speed, what is this kind of talk uh instill for you at this particular moment? Well, it, it's it's normal. I mean, just when the, 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 the infection started, everyone uh, was looking to find a way to prevent it if it comes back, let's say, next year. So some people expected that the vaccine would be available within a couple of weeks. Of course, it's impossible not only to uh, make a vaccine, but then to have it approved and tested and so on. So it takes a year or a year and a half. And teams all around the world started um, making their research on that. Some of them spoke probably too early, and some of them seems to have been mixing up two things. One thing is the scientific discovery, and something else is the production. If the whole world 
um, is willing to have vaccine uh, available and administered, then uh, one single plant won't be sufficient. And probably it's, it might be the case that the patent will be uh, universal, offered to the world community. Otherwise, some countries will not be able to access it. And then some uh, other plants will be uh, called to manufacture enough doses to have all those who want the vaccine, all the uh, medical uh, and other professional health professional to to uh, have it and, and the patients to receive it. Uh, so it's another question about uh, the production of the vaccine and the um, and the um, administration uh, of the vaccine. So Stuart Bloomer, you hear it? It's not one space race, but two. The, the race to develop a vaccine, I believe there's something like 76 different attempts that are taking place, and then the race to mass produce it. Yes, it's, uh, it's clear that when there is a vaccine or more than one vaccine, I mean, it'll take a long time before enough is produced to, to, to get it even to half the countries in the world. I mean, what we don't know, I think, at the moment is what kind of agreements have been signed between governments and manufacturers. I mean, I've been doing historical research on vaccine production. If we look back at the influenza epidemic of 10 years ago, we find that a number of countries, including most EU countries, had had uh, advanced purchase agreements with manufacturers. So they had a first claim. We don't know if any such agreements have been signed right now. Another thing is the quicker the vaccine is moved into production, and there are obviously going to be social and political pressures to get it out at warp speed. The chance, the, the risk is that it's uh, too little research will have been done on on side effects in distinctive populations. Uh, we won't not only won't we know about the duration of protection or the efficacy, but we won't know whether there might not be groups that will produce bad reactions. That happened with some of the influenza vaccines in 2009 and uh, there are risks in trying to move it along very fast. Yeah. So this is, this is again, we, we can't stress this enough, Yanis Natsis. We're talking about a vaccine that, well, may never be efficient or as in the case of SARS, may never be needed. Uh, we don't know anything because again, we're in an unprecedented situation. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And at the same time, what is what is also very interesting now uh, with COVID nineteen is that we see massive public investment. I mean, we need to remember that innovation is always the result of private, but also public investment. And we see governments recently here in Brussels, we had um, a high profile pledging conference, a virtual one, where you could see governments from all around the globe pledging big amounts of money, considerable amounts of money. And therefore, I think their governments need to use their leverage to make sure that we get to this framework which will handle this scarcity of, of resources. Uh, because as, as the, the fellow speaker said, it is an important question. How do we guarantee equitable access? And access at the end of the day is a political decision. But we need this fair framework. And I think that's also an opportunity in this public health uh, emergency that we are we are experiencing, it is an opportunity to talk about a new social contract between society, patients, and uh, the pharmaceutical companies, the developers, well, we, the manufacturers. Yanis, we certainly didn't see a, a new social contract when, uh, at the outset of the pandemic, we were short on face masks. And uh, France, for instance, requisitioned some that were meant for Sweden. The U.S. Uh, took some that were meant for Europe, etc. Yes, you're very right, Francois. At the same time, we hear pledges for affordable, accessible, available end products, therapeutics against COVID-19. Of course, it remains to be seen what these words actually mean in practice. Um, but I do believe that there is well, there is a necessity. I agree with you. At the beginning of the crisis, we saw borders closing. We saw competition. But at the same time, we see scientists around the globe, across the globe, working together, sharing information. We see um, what I hope will be the new positive change, the new normal. We see a, a step towards uh, collaboration, 
openness. So what something which will hopefully stand out from the business as usual up until now, which was competition and, um, and the secrecy. Dr. Zambrowski, when you see uh, all the arguing taking place in Geneva at that uh, WHO annual conference, uh, is it uh, the, the world coming together the way it's described there by Yanis Natsis? Uh, I want to believe so, but there's another point that uh, we ought to stress right now. Uh, for the mask or even for the breathing machines, the respirators, uh, China had become the manufacturer of the world and most of the mask it'll use everywhere. Most of the breathing machine were manufactured sometimes under uh, an American or, or, or European patent in China. And when China had to close their factories and to close their logistic facilities, uh, we all were deprived and, and people were fighting on the airports when it started reopening. But for vaccines, it's not the same. For vaccines, um, uh, there are plants all over the world. There are plants in the United States and in Canada, uh, plants in all over Europe. And if, if a vaccine is invented somewhere, or if several vaccines are invented, there will be uh, the, the capability for many, many countries to produce it. The question is then, um, who will pay and who will okay. offer the, the vaccine? But I think that the WHO has had a fair policy that most of the countries will agree on that because there is a terrible political risk, despite of a medical risk or a, or a economic risk, but there is a political risk for the country and the um, um, political leaders who would deprive their country uh, and their people to access a vaccine if they are willing to have the vaccination. So it's not only a medical issue, a scientific issue. It's more uh, an economic issue and a political issue. And yeah, you're going to want to serve. You're going to want to serve your own country first if there's a limited number. We. We certainly, but, certainly but, not. No one will be able to serve his own country first. It, it, it's, it's a risk. Again, the medical risk. The borders do not exist. People are traveling. Uh, not, not as much as before, but they will start traveling again. We need manpower coming from elsewhere. We need goods from coming from elsewhere. We need tourists uh, coming from elsewhere. So you cannot just limit the access to a proper vaccination to your own citizens within your own borders. It has, we are a small blue planet or a small green planet. And, and it has never been uh, so easy to, to make this observation as today. We are united, whether we like it or not. Well, some people don't, Stuart Blumer. And uh, we're seeing it, for instance, with uh, testing, right? We have uh, test kits that are rolled out in mass in some countries and not in others. Uh, again, is that economic nationalism or is, it a is that medical nationalism? Or is it just a question of problems in the supply chains in these countries? I'm not going to answer that question precisely, but I think that scientists may see themselves as in, in a collaborative endeavor. And I think scientists, largely speaking, are. We see that in the, in the past, in the development of the smallpox eradication campaign, polio vaccine. But political leaders don't see the world like that, whatever they may say. And I mean, if, if there's a good illustration of that fact, it's the way in which the moral authority that the World Health Organization once enjoyed has been undermined, not only in the last few weeks, but over a long period. And it's a, it's a question whether political leaders, depending on their, 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 their own domestic political situations, will feel themselves bound. I'm not at all convinced. And as for, no, you can't close borders, but what kind of what kind of stigmas, what kind of barriers will be put in the way of people who maybe don't? It's not that they choose not to be vaccinated, but that they have no access to the vaccine. The, the millions of people now who are displaced, living in refugee camps, marginalised. We see what's happened with the polio eradication campaign. The hundreds of thousands of people who've been almost impossible to reach. Are we going to, what are we going to do about people who either choose not to be vaccinated or simply are never, never come into contact with a vaccinator? I'm quite worried about not only the political 
ramifications of all this, but also the ethical ones and the risk that social divides will become even greater, both intranationally and internationally. Yeah, and that brings us to uh, the, what was a giant row here in France last week. You had uh, the global CEO of the French pharmaceutical com company Sanofi, uh, Paul Hudson, giving an interview to the Bloomberg News Agency where he said the right to the biggest pre-orders would have to go probably to the United States because they invested early. That drew a sharp reaction from the French, the uh, President Emmanuel Macron, who called up Sanofi's bosses, reminding them that uh, the French state uh, gives 110 million euros in tax breaks and subsidies to Sanofi every year. Aaron Agunke has more. On Thursday, French pharmaceutical giant Sanofi was forced to clarify its CEO's claims the United States would be first in line if the company finds a vaccine. Its chairman insisting no one country will be given priority. Nous sommes à 600 millions de doses prévisionnelles. Nous sommes en train d'essayer de passer à un milliard de doses pour que l'ensemble des pays, pas uniquement les États-Unis, mais l'ensemble des pays soient servis en même temps. Je veux être extrêmement clair là-dessus. Il ne doit y avoir aucune ambiguïté. But Sanofi is just one of scores of companies working on a vaccine. More than 100 experimental treatments for the virus are currently in development. And because some of the therapeutics are already at an advanced stage, an EU agency says a vaccination could be approved in record time. The bottom line is that we would like this development to come up as rapidly as possible. We know that on average, as an example for a vaccine, it might take 10 or 15 years from bench to market. Now here, the ambition is to try to have such vaccines available in a year from now. And the race to find a treatment has grown increasingly competitive with security-related consequences. The U.S. has accused Chinese operatives of attempting to hack coronavirus research, warning such attacks could undermine treatment development. Uh, before I get Yanis Natsis' reaction to Sanofi, just a, one word, uh, Dr. Zambrowski, do you take it seriously, that, that, that accusation of hacking on the part of the Chinese of research? Everything is possible. There is a bit of mystery about uh, how the Chinese are making the decision. They're, they've been more transparent in this crisis than ever. Yet some people have the Chinese fear, you know, that just uh, it seems so strange. But um, I want to be confident. I want to, um, I, I prefer uh, uh, trusting what, what is coming from China. They gave the sequence of the virus uh, quite early, uh, as early as uh, Beijing um, was really notified uh, after the local authorities probably failed or decided to hide the importance of the, of, of the disease. Mm. And nowadays it seems that they are uh, as president, Chinese president said today, um, they, they are uh, more open and they, they want to share their no, they, they also want to share their doubts. Uh, they are quite proud of what they have achieved. Um, you know that there was an, an, another re-escalating um, of the crisis in the northeast of China a couple of weeks ago. It seems it has been uh, cleared. And so we can, we have probably better working together than against one uh, and the other. And this is true for the American and the Chinese and the European, um, the Japanese as well. There are a couple of countries all over, uh, or continents all over the world who can fight these pandemics. Again, it, it, no country could escape. Uh, so we have to solve the story together. Otherwise, it will always last somewhere and come back. And yet, uh, Yanis Natsis, uh, they, they, you, you heard it there from the Sanofi boss, uh, 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 opening up that, that huge row that we had here in France uh, over this French pharmaceutical company saying that the Americans uh, might get first dibs. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the Lex column in the Financial Times saying the problem you have is that high drug prices mean that U.S. patients account for 70% of the pharmaceutical industry's global profits. Quote, if other countries want more clout, they'll have to pay for it. You agree with that? 
No, I would I would disagree, but I think the statement by the uh, Sanofi CEO is just the beginning, and it gives us a glimpse of the discussions that companies are having internally as we speak. On on the surface of it, we hear a lot of pledges around affordable uh, end products against the COVID nineteen, but I think. The Sanofi uh, CEO, the statement shows that some pharma executives are completely detached from reality. And this is why there was this tremendous backlash. But he said it because this is the standard practice. Indeed, the US market is and has been the most important market in the world. And it is true that the US agencies, when they invest in a product, and this has happened also with Ebola, then they expect that they will get the product whenever that's available, they will get it first. But in this case, this cannot be the case. I mean, it's the business as usual model doesn't work. And this is why there was this tremendous backlash. And this is why I believe there will be a retraction. And this is why Macron also summoned the CEO to, to do the Elysee. But at the same time, governments needs to need to use their to flex their muscle. They need to use their leverage. I mean, we expect, why shouldn't the governments act as on, wise yeah, investors? Yeah. Yes, please. You use their leverage, but uh, mm -hmm. it's not just a question of the fact that the Americans invested in this particular vaccine effort. It's also, and this is the point, one of the points that was made by the by Zenofi's CEO, um, Paul Hudson, is the Americans have a more streamlined approval process. They have this thing called the biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. It's a bit of a mouthful. The acronym is BARDA. So they have this BARDA authority, which the Europeans don't. But that's that's not necessarily part of the problem. A, a European BARDA wouldn't wouldn't fix the problem. I think European government wouldn't bring, it wouldn't bring a possible vaccine to market quicker. The European Medicines Agency has made crystal clear that once it is available, it will do its best to accelerate the approval process. So I wouldn't be concerned about that. On the contrary, I would like to echo what Stuart said earlier. We need to be very careful with this obsession with speed. Obviously, we need to be timely, but we need to be very careful. We don't need to, we don't want to give ammunition to anti-vaxxers. We need to be careful about the safety profile of this product if and when we get it. Um, but just to answer your question, governments in Europe are investing massively in the R&D process. It's true, the US government is doing the same. Governments need to act as wise investors, and we need to make sure that there is a mapping and tracking of these public investment. We need to make sure that there are some public interest conditionalities attached to it, and we need to make sure that this is all done in a transparent way. Uh, so I'm saying though, Stuart Bluma, and you, again, you're the historian here, that um, governments don't have a very good track record when it comes to uh, to running private businesses, in this case, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, or uh, we saw it with masks, where the, the, the argument's been made that once the big distribution companies got involved, they did a better job than, say, the French government here. Well, I think it's true to say that on the whole, the track record of governments in running companies is not so brilliant, although there are more than one model. I mean, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be run as, as it might have been in a centrally planned socialist economy of 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, but the public sector vaccine institutes, which catered to the vaccination programs of many countries from the beginnings of the, from the beginning of the 20th century until the 1980s produced the vaccines that were needed uh, how they came to be put out of business is quite a complicated story but it certainly has something to do with the uh, growing unwillingness of the private sector to collaborate with them in sharing knowledge or granting licenses uh, so i i I don't think that we can, we can, as some people have said, nationalize the pharmaceutical industry or convert pharmaceutical companies into state corporations. But I think there's scope for a system that innovates in the interest principally or indeed exclusively of, of public health. Because also, I mean, an epidemic or a pandemic is not only viruses, it's about social behavior. And part of the problem, it's, it's another issue, is that I think we've come to see a vaccine as the, as the kind of 
holy grail that will solve all problems. It really won't, not only because of questions of price and access, but also because uh, vaccinating everybody, we don't know, as, as has been said, we don't know how long the vaccine will be effective. Uh, we, there's a whole lot of things we don't know. So I, I think we, this has been a, yeah, uh, the, the question was about state production of vaccines. I let think, me ask, let me, let me bring in Jean-Jacques Zambrowski on this. Dr. Yeah. Zambrowski, uh, what was your reaction when you first heard uh, that statement by the CEO of uh, Sanofi? You know, it's quite unusual to see public money given to pharmaceutical companies in the United States of America. So since they had in this precise case given billions uh, for pharmaceutical industry as a whole, um, somebody has to reward the government from this sponsorship. Now, you must know also that although um, Sanofi is supposed to be a French-based company, it has 15,000 employees in the United States, including production and research, research and production. So they, they probably rapidly, this guy, Paul Hudson, who is uh, uh, born in the United Kingdom, uh, wanted to reward uh, their American uh, um, um, owners, uh, the people who buy the shares uh, in the United States, um, um, to reward them from their sponsorship. And then uh, the American plant will probably produce vaccine from the United States, which actually sounds normal, provided at the same time, at the very same time as the president of the company said, uh, oh, over, over the chief executive officer, the president, uh, Mr. Weinberg, who is French, said that everyone will have the, con the, the, pro the vaccine if it exists and if it comes out from Sanofi's research at the same time. So I was shocked like everyone. Then I understood that he spoke to the Americans from an American point of view. And then uh, I was reassured when the president of the company said, uh, if we uh, find a vaccine and if we launch a vaccine, everyone in the world will have it at the same time. And actually, it was right to say so before even the, there was a reaction from the political authority throughout the world. Um, do, you agree, do you agree with both Stuart and Yanis that this I certainly do. I do. We think of uh, the relationship between governments and the pharmaceutical industry? Definitely, yes. They know that there has been a split between the pharmaceutical industry and the governments, essentially in Europe, where, where all the uh, health insurance is controlled, if not paid by the government. So, but there has been a dramatic split some 30 or 40 years ago. And now yeah. that they, they look uh, at each other like enemies, it's time to build a new relationship based on trust, based on work together for public health issues. There are a lot of unmet needs uh, for which th there cannot be, uh, I mean, no public uh, industry, no public research can take the risk uh, that the pharmaceutical companies are taking. So there must be um, a kind of a, a new era. And if this crisis has a benefit, it can be the same as for ethics and for the ethics of uh, social groups. We, we, we have to take this crisis, this, this pandemia uh, worldwide as a chance to have a new look at some things which we have left. Um, um, but uh, but Dr. Zambrowski, you, you know the United States well. And I do. That brings us to uh, having worked there yourself. Uh, you, uh, when you see right now what's going on over there, we mentioned earlier that authority for uh, approving uh, vaccines, BARDA as it's called, uh, its head was fired. In fact, he testified before Congress last week acting as a whistleblower against the Trump administration, uh, when you see that, and when you contrast it, if you will, uh, to uh, what, the, uh, uh, what the situation was back in 2014 under the previous administration, when uh, the Ebola pandemic broke out in West Africa, Barack Obama at the time sending in the U.S. Corps, Army Corps of Engineers to help uh, with the response, the U.S. Uh, taking that global leadership role at the time, uh, the same Barack Obama who uh, gave a speech to all high school seniors graduating in the United States this weekend with some sharp words for the current administration. Let's listen.
that our society and our democracy only works when we think not just about ourselves, but about each other. More than anything, this pandemic has fully finally torn back the curtain on the idea that so many of the folks in charge know what they're doing. A lot of them aren't even pretending to be in charge. If the world's going to get better, it's going to be up to you. Uh, Jean-Jacques Zambrowski, uh, the, what makes this pandemic unprecedented is the United States no longer has the role it once had. Well, there are about 60,000 people, I guess, who who died um, throughout the United States. Of course, more in those parts of the United States where people are coming all, go, going all over the world. Uh, but they cannot say that, <coughs> that the virus that just flew over the U.S. like the a nuclear cloud flew over France, you know, in the uh, when there was this plant in, in, in Russia uh, some years ago. Um, so, um, I think they are inside the, the, the story. Uh, I think that President Obama and, and, and uh, um, President, uh, the current President of the United States are thinking of the next election. Uh, and I think that the policy adopted by the current administration will play a role in the discussions uh, and the votes of some of the Americans, um, not all of them, of course, uh, but the economy also uh, is uh, uh, suffering quite much in the United States. So all this is complicated. No country can escape, including the United States. They have but, to but, face but, the situation. Okay, hang, on, hang on a sec. Dr. Zambrowski, we mentioned it earlier. The U.S. system seems to suck all the money its way. We, we talked about uh, uh, how much uh, the 70 percent of the profits pharmaceutical companies make is on the U.S. market because of the way the system is set up. So with the current climate the way it is, uh, how toxic is it that the fact that you have U.S. politics having an impact on the rest of the planet? But the American people will keep suffering from many, many diseases. They will keep. I'm not asking about the American people. I'm asking what impact on the rest of the planet. Well, there will be a kind of a diet for everyone, including the pharmaceutical companies. They will have to um, uh, be cautious about their expenses in the forthcoming years. Uh, but the whole world will have to do. And this, of course, is true for the um, uh, plane manufacturers, for many, uh, for the computer uh, and, and, and cell phones manufacturers. Every, uh, many, many things are, are located in the US and a lot of the profit is made in the United States. And even if 50 or 70 percent of, of the innovation products are made uh, in the US or uh, the profit is made there. There are also pharmaceutical companies elsewhere, including in developing countries. So maybe it's time to 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 turn the wheel and, and to find um, another mode of, of functioning. I, I think that the next day will not be like the day before. Stuart Blumer, how much how destabilizing is the impact of this, uh, uh, as Dr. Zambrowski mentioned it, the, the, the rhetoric in the buildup to the 2020 election in the U.S., how destabilizing is it for the rest of the planet? Well, I, I, I think that the, really the most important thing to realize is that international public health or global health is has become total. It is about is about politics. It's about international prestige. It's about local politics. It's only partly about health, and so and certainly the United States not only is a major market and a major source of innovation, but politically a tremendous influence on on institutions and on priorities in the rest of the world. Why why are we spend, Why have we for the last thirty years? been spending so much money on trying to eradicate polio, which most countries in the world don't regard as very serious. The United States has a, an enormous influence on you know, the priorities that count, the way we try to tackle problems. I think the, the United States, the, the general election, in, the, the presidential election in, in November will have a huge influence, depending on what changes, because this administration obviously has further undermined the the role of global institutions, the, the, the possibilities of multilateralism, 
whatever scientists may desire and whatever public health uh, officials may may desire uh, it's the politicians who who make the running and who are often concerned principally with their own political futures and obviously the, the united states has a major influence on all of this especially on institutions and global priorities which go far beyond what the pharmaceutical industry can do or can't do we can complain about it yanis natsis but at the end of the day sitting where we all are is the fault no no nobody else's but the europeans for not having a common european health policy well that's we will see what happens to that and if eu governments national governments are willing to transfer more competence to to brussels to to give um, uh, the eu a real mandate on uh, on health policy making but i think you know the recent debate also around access to medicines and the high prices of medicines in europe we've seen an unprecedented fully fledged political debate the, the high prices of medicines i think will remain a topic especially post covid i mean especially now that we see that numerous um, eu member states are suffering economically uh, some of them are going to be bankrupt post covid so i think that's where it's it's important to discuss about a new social contract between the the pharmaceutical companies and governments and yes the e the us is important as a market but europe is important as well and i think we need to uh, governments realize that they are not passive donors and european citizens realize that we also fund a big chunk of um, medical R&D, biomedical R&D, drug development. So whatever we get out of COVID-19 in terms of creating new precedents, um, we could expand it possibly to other pandemics like cancer, for instance. Um, or if, if we manage to change the model, for instance, for this vaccine, if we get to a vaccine and whenever we get to a vaccine against or vaccines against COVID-19, why not use um, uh, the similar model and, and, and make the most out of what we managed to change in, in a model that sh has shown its limitations. Huh? We, we are talking about the limitations of the current business model. So there is there are opportunities, uh, even in the midst of this public health emergency. Um, we will see what happens with other topics such as decoupling from China, for instance. We will see what Europeans will do in terms also of boosting in the manufacturing capacity. Um, I think we are still, all of these questions cannot be answered right now. But uh, there will be some very uh, political discussions coming up our way um, in the coming uh, weeks and months. We're almost out of time, uh, Yanis uh, Natsis. The, the political momentum is on your side right now. Uh, but as you know, Brussels is all about lobbying. Uh, is it easier or harder to, to lobby when, you have, uh, when you're having you know, virtual meetings and Zoom conferences and this kind of thing? It is harder, and to be very frank with you, as a citizen, I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit concerned that right now with all of these e-meetings, we have no clue uh, what's happening. And of course, for instance, I'll give you an example. The European Commissioner and let's say the, the, the EU's um, top management uh, meets e-meets virtually, regularly with all sorts of industries, individual companies, but we don't know what is being discussed. And yes, I, I can understand that there has to be a certain degree of confidentiality or possibly secrecy when, you, when you're on a crisis management mode, but this should not be the new norm. This is going to be highly problematic. And at the end of the day, it will undermine citizens' faith in the system and trust in managing the crisis. And not only this one, but also the next crisis. So uh, it is, I'm, I'm concerned uh, because at least from this e-meetings, e virtual meetings, call them whatever you want, um, the WhatsApp discussions. We need to have transparency, accountability. We need to have agendas published. We need to have minutes published. Um, we, there has been tremendous progress towards more transparency and accountability in recent years, but I fear that we may backtrack on that. But again, I'm, I need to remain confident and optimistic that we will not go down that path. All right, Yanis Natsis, I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, from Brussels. Thank you. Uh, uh, Stuart Bluma in uh, Amsterdam, Jean-Jacques Zambrowski uh, here in Paris. Thank you for being with us. And uh, yeah, once again, we want to thank all our viewers for joining us in ever greater numbers on Facebook, on Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. More on France24.com. Bye for now. 
Nari Sabrikas, and you'll usually find me in news reporting on Greece's enduring financial turmoil and protests, but also the refugee emergency here on France 24. Nathalie Sabrikas, one of the 200 France 24 correspondents around the world. At France 24, our goal is to follow the news around the world as it develops and keep you informed at all times. The coronavirus pandemic is hitting us all hard, not just in France, but everywhere. We at France 24 are determined to provide you with reliable and verified information as the world confronts the biggest health crisis for a century. Wherever we are, however best we can, we're trying our utmost to keep on bringing you the very latest news. France 24 is on the ground, reporting from the field in English, French, Arabic and Spanish. Keep watching and reading on France24.com. France 24, our mission is to inform you. Liberté, égalité, actualité.